Good morning. Good morning. Everybody's ready for the quiz today? Yeah. All right. Yeah, your pencils, your blue books. You got, what is it, 90 minutes? <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, can I get away without using a microphone in here? Can the people in the back, I see nods. This is okay. Yeah, great. I'll just use my big mouth. Yeah, but we'll, we'll be fine. Um, well, I, I'm Dave, and uh, thank you for all getting up at 5 a.m. West Coast time to come in and, and uh, hear me talk. Uh, if you're into live tweeting, Ann and I have joined the world of social media, uh, um, and feel free to tweet it out. There's our stuff up there on the screen. I'm going to talk to you today about two out of the three books that are up on the screen at the moment. And uh, my co-author on the middle book uh, is going to be talking after, right after me in the same room. So if you're interested in that stuff, stick around for her talk. Uh, and I'm a geologist. I'm not a farmer. I'm not a biologist. I'm not an agronomist. And so you may wonder, how would a geologist end up writing a series of books that what I, Ann and I jokingly refer to as our dirt trilogy uh, about soil and its importance to human civilization, sort of how it works and uh, how we might fix the problems that we've actually created through our management of soil. Uh, and I'm going to try and go through a bit of that today. Uh, and essentially, this first book, Dirt, came out about 10 years ago. Uh, and that's the one that you might expect a geologist to write because it looks backwards through history. It looks at the role of the way people have treated land, how that has affected the, the longevity and prosperity of civilizations throughout history. Uh, and I'll give you a bit of the, the data and the details behind that as we go into it. But that basically defines the scope of the problem. What, what, what has gone wrong historically? with the way that we have interacted with the land. This middle book, uh, The Hidden Half of Nature, Anne will give you a lot more detail about what's in it, but it basically uh, suffice it to say that she's a biologist, I'm a geologist, and this is the story of how we learned through restoring the soil in our yard about the importance of microbial life in the soil and its absolute centrality to having healthy, fertile soil, how that worked. 
And Growing a Revolution is the book that just came out uh, this last spring, and it tells about how he visited farmers around the world, applying the lessons of dirt, the insights of the hidden half of nature, into thinking about the problem of how could we restore soil at a global scale. Because it's this, the problem uh, need for global soil restoration is what I like to refer to as humanity's biggest infrastructure challenge. Um, we're going to go through the three of those, but first I'm going to ask a simple question. Which planet would you rather live on? <laughs> the blue one or the red one? Uh, and this is not a trick political question. <laughs> but what are the difference between these two planets? Well, there's three really big differences that matter a lot for us and all of life, it turns out. One is just the color. There's a lot of water on Earth. We still argue as planetary scientists, and I'm a, a geologist, as I said, but I also work on planetary science stuff, so I've worked on water on Mars. We're still arguing about water on Mars. There's no argument about the importance of water on Earth. How about the atmosphere? You know, we can breathe on this planet, we can't on that planet. Those are pretty obvious. But the third one is the one that we don't tend to think about that is just as important as those other two. There's soil on this planet, there's no soil on that planet. And the idea that we may go off and actually farm on Mars someday uh, despite Matt Damon's wonderful uh, <laughs> characterization of it, uh, you know, the, if you look at the chemistry of the soils on Mars, they're battery acid. They're like Epsom, they're Epsom salts or battery acid are kind of what you're looking at there. Not the world's best farming soils. Um, so, yeah, we're going to vote for the blue planet as well. But why do I sort of go through this? If we look at the state of soils in the world today, it's not a terribly pretty picture. We've done a lot of damage to the world's agricultural lands. This is the UN's global map of soil degradation for a few years ago now. And you'll notice there's a lot of red and yellow areas on this map, areas of very degraded or degraded soil in terms of the land's ability to support agriculture. Now, I also want to point out, though, that by the end of this talk, I'm going to spend the first, oh, 20 minutes or so depressing you. I'm going to hope that by the end of it that I can convince you that the problem that you can see on this map is not only solvable, we could solve it remarkably fast without inventing any new technology. There are places within each of these red zones on the map where you can find farms where farmers are building fertile soil and restoring life to their land, despite the pattern that you see at the gross takeaway level with this map. Uh, that's where I want to end up in terms of how to do it. Uh, but first, we have to go through a few sober uh, realizations, like why should we bother worrying about the world's soils? Why should we bother trying to restore them at a global scale, let alone on anyone's individual farm? About you know, a few years back, David Pimentel and colleagues tallied up the sort of the damage that soil erosion and degradation had done to the world's farmland soils, and they came to the conclusion that since the Second World War, uh, by the mid-90s, we had lost some 430 million hectares of arable land was no longer farmed around the world due to soil degradation. That's an area of land equal to about a third of all present cropland, an area the size of China and India combined. And when you think about the problem of feeding the world 100 years from now, or even 10 years from now, it would sure be useful to still have that third of the world's cropland at its full native productive capacity. And, you know, just in case you're wondering, oops, there we go. I'll keep hitting the wrong things up here. Uh, if you're wondering whether this problem has been solved in the last 30 years or so, the most recent global soil assessment I can find is from the UN Global State of the Soil Ass uh, Assessment that uh, argued that humanity, that's us, is losing another 0.3% of our global food production capacity each year to soil erosion and degradation. This is an ongoing problem. And as I'll show you in a few minutes, this is a problem that's been going on for a very long time, although at a slower pace. We've gotten better at it. 0.3% um, a year. That's a kind of a slow rate, right? It's kind of like, you know, in the, uh, even in the end of what our savings accounts might be getting these days. Um, but if you think like a geologist, 0.3% a year is actually a screamingly fast rate. Because if you play that out over the next 100 years, we're on track to lose another 30% of our global agricultural production capacity simply from doing the things we're doing now. If you add that to the third of the world's cropland we've already degraded, and you project that out another century, we, we are on track to have degraded two-thirds of the world's agricultural capacity at a time when our population is expected to grow by 50%. Those two numbers are working against each other. And the long-term pattern of soil degradation is what I wrote about in dirt. And this is where being a geologist came into play, because I was it, um, accustomed to looking back through history to think about the long-term effects of soil erosion. 
and you look like you're up to something. I need you to use this or talk in here, please. Um, let me turn I'll just on. talk into there. Yeah. Perfect. So that's what I wrote. That's what I wrote about in dirt. Was essentially looking back through civilizations, doing, looking at the ar archaeological data, looking at the state of soils in different parts of the world to try and put together the story of how have people interacted with their land over the last 10,000 years of agriculture. And I didn't think I was writing a history of farming when I started to write that book. But in the end, that's what that book became. I was just curious about the patterns and space and scope of soil erosion through history. Why? Because that's what I study as a geologist, as someone who studies how landscapes are shaped. So I got into this essentially quite innocently. And what I found is that when you look back through the history of societies around the world, there's strong evidence that soil erosion played a role in the demise of ancient civilizations all over the world. Now, if you look in environmental history textbooks, what you'll find is the idea that deforestation led to soil erosion that impacted ancient societies. And I've done enough research on the West Coast on steep lands where we've managed to cut the trees down for several generations now, um, where if you add up the pace of soil erosion due to deforestation, it doesn't add up to anywhere near what you would need to explain the wholesale loss of soil off of large regions of terrain, as I'll show you in a few minutes. Um, in other words, I came to the conclusion in researching this book that it wasn't the axe that caused the problems throughout history. It was the plow. It was the way that we have farmed. And why is that? Because the axe may clear a forest off of land to pave the way for the plow, but the plow keeps the land bare and vulnerable to erosion by wind or rain. These are all just a few of the, re of the regions that I document, uh, documented in dirt. And the villain of the dirt book, if a nonfiction book can be said to actually have a villain, was the plow. And that is for the very simple reason that the plow does something to the surface of the planet that nature doesn't tend to do other than in fairly rare catastrophic events. And that's leaves the, the surface of the land bare and vulnerable to erosion by wind and rain. Nature tends to clothe herself in plants, and that's for very good reason. It protects the ground surface, it allows plants to add organic matter to the soil, that allows the soil to become uh, enriched and supports the growth of plants. There's a, there's a, a, a symbiosis there. What happens when we till the land is it undoes that. It essentially leaves the land bare and vulnerable to erosion by wind or rain until the next crop comes in or weeds come in or the forest takes back over. Uh, and this can be a problem when it's maintained over generations. One of the big problems with soil erosion, as I'll show you in a minute, is that it happens fairly slowly. <laughs> but even things that happen slowly that are persist over long periods of time can really add up. And that's squarely in the realm of what geologists think about Oh, and I'll just point out that this uh, image up here is the oldest known image that we have of a plow. It's from an ancient Sumerian cylinder seal. It's something that's about the size of my index finger. It's a uh, rolled, it's baked clay. And the reason that these guys look like space aliens trailing behind yamas are not because of some Eric von Donneken connection between South Africa and Mesopotamia. It's because of the limitations of the medium of baked clay. Oops, and this... This thing doesn't want to advance. There we go. They could still, okay, well, they could still be aliens. <laughs> yeah, we're not going there. Um, <laughs> so why would a geologist think that the plow was something that had done, had uh, you know, been very damaging to civilizations throughout history? Um, you know, we're taught, after all, to teach, to, to turn our swords into plowshares. But if you look at the damage that the plow does to the land over the long time, that may not be the best lesson after all. And this, this photograph illustrates why a geologist would come to that conclusion. It's from the Palouse region of eastern Washington. So it's loose terrain. It's this beautiful, fertile, silty soil that was blown in by the wind during the last ice age. And this is a winter wheat field. And you don't notice much in the way of plants on it, do you? It's a freshly plowed winter wheat field on which rain fell. And notice what happened to the terrain. It's, it's carved up by all those little channels. They're called rills because you can drive a tractor over them and erase them with a single pass of the plow. But they add up. Where does that soil go? Well, it goes downhill until it finds a place to park on a gentler slope or ends up in a reservoir or ends up in the ocean. Well, that's a whole topic for a whole nother lecture, and you don't want me to be talking to midnight till midnight, so I'm going to skip it. But the key thing is, is that this is a photograph taken 30 years after the establishment of the Soil Conservation Service showing a practice that a geologist would look at and just go, that soil is just bleeding off this landscape. Okay, well, how much does that add up to? 
This is another photograph from the Palouse taken back in 1961 by Vernon Kaiser, and it shows you another winter wheat field in the Palouse region where this fence up here is a fence that was the farmer built around uh, their water cistern in 1911 when this field was first uh, plowed. And the only thing that happened on this field in the subsequent 50 years till 1961 when the photo was taken is it was uh, um, uh, planted in winter wheat and was in a wheat fallow rotation, if I'm recalling the original paper right. And by 1961, this cliff developed right along the, 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 that line. You can still see cliffs like this along fence rows all over the Palouse and, or uh, cemeteries in the Midwest, if you go and look at those. Uh, well, how big a deal is this? Well, that little black line from there to there is a one-foot increment on a stadia rod, on a survey rod, that's kind of washed out of the negative of the picture. But Kaiser put that in there because this is about a five-foot cliff, and this gives you a sense of scale. So if you had five feet of erosion in 50 years off this field, due essentially to just tillage-based erosion and the, the action of those little rills over time, that's what? That's about a foot a decade. That's about an inch a year. There's nowhere on earth, and I will show you data in a minute, where soils form at a pace of an inch a year. And this is meant to illustrate the problem that soil erosion that happens faster than soil production, but faster than you're replacing it, essentially leads you to run out of it. You're burning it down. Any system where you expend something faster than you replace it means you're running out of whatever it is you, you have. Whether it's your bank account, and having done this experiment several times myself, I can vouch for the fact that if you basically go to grad school and spend all your money that faster than you make income, you, you kind of lose your savings. Um, you can think of soil as civilization savings account. It's our natural capital. It is what we use to um, fund our living, in effect. You should also be sitting there thinking, Dave, this is a really extreme example. Of course it is. That's why I use it. <laughs> um, let me show you another example that's a bit less extreme, but just as shocking. It covers a whole region, and then I'll move out to the world. Uh, so this shows you uh, the magnitude of historical soil erosion in the Piedmont region, the hill country ranging from Virginia down to Alabama. So it's the American southeast. It's one of the original breadbaskets of the American colonies. And geologists have gone through and figured out how much soil has been lost in the last couple centuries as a result of colonial and post-colonial agriculture. And what you have, you see this gray noodle here is four to ten inches of topsoil loss over most of the region. Um, the black stuff is more than 10 inches, and I'm not talking about the coastal plains. Erosion and geology are a little different there. I'm not talking about the high Appalachians. I'm talking about this area of hill country, this upland country, that would be very vulnerable to the effects of soil erosion. And basically, we've got four to more than 10 inches of soil loss in a couple hundred years. Well, how big a deal is that? If you go back and actually read the journals of the original people who were breaking this land for uh, early farms, there were about 6 to 12 inches of fertile black soil across this region to begin with. In other words, we've managed to erode off a third to almost all of the topsoil across a broad region that was once one of the breadbaskets of um, European colonization on this continent. And if we could do that in just 200 years of plow-based agriculture, think what the Greeks could have done with a 1,000-year run at southern Greece. Think what the Romans could have done with an 800-year run at central Italy. It helps explain why things like uh, – has anyone ever been to the, uh, the famous port of Rome? Uh, Ostia, is it anywhere near the coast? <laughs> no, it's not near the coast anymore because the soils of central Italy were basically eroded down by agricultural practices from two to the second century BC to the second century AD, built out the deltas and stranded the, the, the port of Rome. In fact, by the end of the Roman Empire, by the late stages of the Roman Empire, um, the hills of central Italy were not feeding Rome. It was the hills of northern Africa and the hills of Syria. Think about the sort of implication for the long term, that if you go back and look at tax, Roman tax records in Syria and Libya, you can find evidence of large harvests of wheat in areas where we don't think of as anything other than sort of geopolitical basket cases today. Societies that destroy their land, that destroy their soil, don't do their descendants any favors. Um, and we have our own little example in North America, because if you go out and you go to North Carolina, uh, as I got invited to do uh, for a, um, a TV show a couple years ago that was interested in looking at what is the story of soil in North America to insert into a broader special, and you had just three minutes to play with, um, what could you do? Well, 
I went to a tobacco plantation in North Carolina, put out a white tablecloth, I think because Ray Archuleta suggested this would be a great thing to do, if I recall, um, and basically dug a hole in the, one of those tobacco fields. Uh, and this is, this is the soil of the conventional tobacco field today. Uh, you'll notice that it basically looks like beach sand. And that's basically what I had to collect. And I'm just going to show you two slides that have data on them. If you're really interested in all this data, uh, I published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that has the Excel spreadsheet. Nobody should ever have to recompile this data. <laughs> Steal my spreadsheet. Use it. Add to it. That's the whole point of publishing those things. Uh, but I basically found 1,400 studies, uh, and I've arrayed them here from left being low erosion rate to high erosion rate on the right with four different kinds of data that I'll walk through. Uh, it's a simple graph. It's a one-dimensional graph. The only thing we're showing are these different kinds of data and then the erosion rate from each study as a, uh, along the x-axis. You'll notice, though, that the, the scale on it is logarithmic. Each one of these big ticks is a factor of 10. So it's just like the, the Richter scale for earthquakes. Each number goes for a factor of 10. So the first thing you can see on this graph is, wow, erosion rates go from like a ten thousandth of a millimeter a year all the way up to the, the decimeter a year. Uh, there's, what, six, seven orders of magnitude variation. Erosion rates are highly variable quite naturally in terms of different parts of the world. And down here, ten thousandth of a millimeter a year, that's hard to measure. If you can figure out how to measure in real time something that erodes at a ten thousandth of a millimeter a year, let me know. <laughs> On the other hand, over here, you, you could just use a ruler. <laughs> um, so what's the key point of this? Well, there's three. Let's walk first through the three different kinds of natural data that I'm showing here. The first one down the bottom are for cratons. And, of course, everybody knows what a craton is, right? Yeah. No? And so, well, it's not something that goes in a salad. <laughs> a craton is the flat, tectonically dead part of a continent. So it's places where the rocks aren't being pushed up very fast by geological forces. So think the American Midwest, think the heart of Australia, think most of Africa outside of the rift zone that spawned us, um, think the shield of Canada. You know, These are places that you can think of are fairly low gradient, they're kind of flat, they erode fairly slowly. Yeah, they erode at less than a hundredth of a millimeter a year. Soil mantle terrain, what is that? That's areas like the hills of Tennessee, the rolling hills of California, that, that Piedmont zone that I was just talking about uh, on the East Coast. Those are places where you have soil, and they erode up to about a millimeter a year or so. Alpine and glaciated terrain, what's that? That's basically real mountains. That's like the Andes. It's the Cascades. It's the Alps in Europe. It's the, uh, the Himalaya. Those are the places on the planet where you have erosion rates that exceed about a millimeter a year. And in fact, the highest natural erosion rate we've ever measured uh, are over here. Uh, this, this point here is the gorge of the Tsangpo River that drains off of eastern Tibet. I've studied that because it is such an incredible geological anomaly that it's eroding at the pace of about a centimeter a year, which to a geologist is just amazingly fast. What about these black data points? That's data that comes from tillage-based agriculture. This is what I would call conventional agriculture. And it's from uh, small-scale farms with, with hand-operated equipment all the way up to very large industrial farms in the developed world. Uh, and you'll notice it goes from a tenth of a millimeter year or so up to even higher than the Tsangpo Gorge. Uh, and if you play the game of which of, these, which of these natural environments does modern agriculture most emulate in terms of its raw erosion rate, you come to the conclusion that conventionally plowed farms erode like alpine topography. Think about that for a minute. We've managed to turn Kansas into a place that erodes like the Himalaya. That's quite an achievement, if for anyone who's keeping score. Um, and conventional, it also shows you that conventional agriculture is unsustainable in soil mantle landscapes. These data, these black data are all skewed way over to the right compared to soil mantle landscapes. What does this mean? Well, first of all, it means the T values that the USDA uses are, are like not worth the paper they're printed on. Um, and it also means that we simply can't maintain this style of agriculture in the parts of the world where we actually grow our food for very long in terms of the way that a geologist looks at it. They're out of balance. It's not sustainable over the long run. Um, and this, I don't see any way around that conclusion from this data. Now, most people don't like to look at such a smattering of data. What I've done is basically simplified this down to the median. So it's like half the studies are smaller rates, half the studies are larger rates. It's a way to show you the average of all these and to introduce some other kinds of data that will start to reintroduce hope back into this presentation. Um, 
So we've got different measurement types, and we've got the averages over here on the right. And what we're showing in terms of uh, the things that are in the parentheses, that's the number of peer-reviewed academic studies that are behind each of those average numbers. So the, how many studies did I average to get that, that global average? Conventional erosion rates, you average the erosion rate off of conventional fields from the ones that I found, and it's about a millimeter and a half a year. That sounds like a pretty slow rate. Your fingernails grow about 10 times faster than that, after all. But when you think about the long term, it's fast. You compare that to these blue numbers at the bottom, the erosion rates under native vegetation. If you go out and study erosion rates in national parks or in, the, in grasslands, uh, you get about a 1% of a millimeter a year. You look at long-term rates of soil production from the studies that actually directly look at how fast does nature make soils, the average is about 2% of a millimeter a year. Long-term geological erosion rates, 3% of a millimeter a year. These numbers are all pretty much the same. They're different than that red number, like an order of magnitude or two. This other number, the erosion rate under no-till agriculture, is where you can start to re-interject re hope into this thing. Because these, this tenth of a millimeter a year erosion rate, while it's a little higher than long-term natural rates, um, is much closer. It's at least in the same order of magnitude as rates of soil formation. And it's from agricultural fields. It's from places practicing no-till agriculture. So herein lies both the good news and the bad news. Because, let's see, what should we start with first? Uh, <laughs> the bad news is that conventional agriculture is outstripping, the rates of erosion are outstripping natural rates of soil formation by a couple orders of magnitude. The good news is that it's not because we farm. It's because of the way that we've been farming. We actually have ways of farming that could slow erosion down to close to natural rates of soil production. The second round of bad news is that we tend to call those, those practices of farming alternative agriculture. Oops. There we go. So I'd invite you to sort of think about this in terms of the way that I often encourage graduate students to think about things, which is to you know run the numbers that you've just been given through a simple thought experiment on the back of a napkin. And what you can do is basically forecast the longevity of an agricultural civilization. Because if you take that global average of a, about a millimeter a year or so of net soil loss, how long would it take to erode a typical half meter to one meter thick hillside soil? It would take about 500 to 1,000 years. And that's about the, the average longevity of major agricultural civilizations around the world with some really big key exceptions that kind of help prove the generality of the supposition that I'm offering. And what are those exceptions? Well, it's the big floodplain rivers of the world, like the Indus and the Brahmaputra in India, the Tigris and Euphrates, where uh, you know, agricultural civilizations first started to develop. Uh, it's the Nile in Egypt. It's the rivers of eastern China. These are basically places where we were able to maintain agricultural production for millennia, in part because they receive an annual supplement of fresh minerals from flooding. So what floodplains do, after all. But if you want to find civilizations that have degraded their soil, look at the headwaters of these areas that have been maintained for thousands of years. Look at Syria. Look at Somalia and Ethiopia and on the Nile. Look at the Himalaya on the Tigris and the Euphrates, on, on the Indus and the Brahmaputra. Look at the ancient, the original seat of Chinese agriculture on the edge of the Tibetan Plateau, where they are eventually forced off the plateau by soil degradation down into the alluvial lowlands. You need to look only in the headwaters of these great long-lived civiliz agricultural civilizations to find the lessons on what it means for farming outside of floodplains to have soil loss exceed the pace of soil building. So... At this point, we can basically soundly endorse FDR's uh, um, a wise statement to the governor of the then all 48 states uh, back in 1937 in the aftermath of the Dust Bowl um, that a nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. And there's a reason here that I started with a picture of the planet, because we now, with an integrated global society, we, we run the risk of repeating this experiment at a global scale, and we simply don't have new continents or new places to go to. And I also want to point out that this photograph is the photograph that I used in the cover of the dirt book. It's from an area in South Dakota that we're going to visit again in a few minutes um, and show you a very different ending to this story. So the question that I started was left with after writing the dirt book was, is it possible to actually restore the world's soils? Um, could we reverse this global pattern of, of land degradation? And I put that aside for a few years to write a very non-controversial book on the history of the relationship between science and religion. Because 
Because um, actually writing the last chapter of the Dirt Book was difficult because I didn't want to write a depressing book. But when you look back through history, the story is kind of depressing. Um, I finally, years later, got around to think to writing the book that is much more optimistic. Uh, and that basically started in my own yard. And Anne is going to talk a lot more about this uh, in the talk after this one. So I'm going to leave most of that to her. But I'm going to give you basically a bit of a feel for what helped start – me on the path of thinking that, wow, not only can we solve the problem of soil degradation, but we could do it a lot faster than we generated the problem. We could actually do it on timescales that ought to be relevant to policymakers, even if they're not. Uh, and that's the story that we lay out in the hidden half of nature. Um, and it was basically the way that Anne and I figured, uh, learned about the kind of stuff that, um, that Elaine Ingham uh, writes about or talks about um, in terms of the role of microbes in, in soil fertility and the role of bi the importance of biology in soil life and agriculture. And we learned this in our own yard because we bought a house in North Seattle back in the late 1990s after I got tenure at the University of Washington and we decided to stay in the rainy corner of the, of the country. Uh, we bought a house and Anne wanted a garden and when we peeled the lawn that the house came with. It was one of those old growth Seattle lawns where it had been there for a hundred years, six inches of tangled roots. We peeled it off. There wasn't a single life form, no worms. I mean, we didn't see any life in the yard. We had basically dirt, um, which was kind of ironic given the book that I had just finished writing. Um, and she'll show you how she transformed the yard. Uh, but basically she realized that when you think about what makes for healthy, fertile soil, it's the marriage of geology and biology. And she's a biologist, and she realized that we had the geology, but we didn't have the biology in the yard. So she started, uh, she went on what she describes as her organic matter crusade, bringing as much organic matter back to her yard as she could possibly find and scrounge and scavenge. She'll tell you much more about uh, the details of that and the role of soil life in it. I just want to show you that we, this is the soil that we started with. This is the soil that we have today. And you can see this on a Nova episode that will be broadcast probably this spring. We're finally starting to pay attention to soil. Um, but this was basically uh, glacial, glacial till and fill. It had less than half a percent organic matter. Um, it was not very fertile when we started. Today we're up to about between 8 and 10 percent organic matter across most of the yard, even more in the vegetable beds. Uh, and you'll notice the color difference. What's behind that color difference? Well, it's carbon. Uh, and what's responsible for that? In great part, the plants and microbes and the symbioses between them. And this is the part that Anne and I describe in The Hidden Half of Nature as sort of opening our minds to the importance of things that plants are doing that we weren't taught that they were doing when we took soil science classes. Uh, and basically, we all know that plants are taking carbon dioxide, merging it with water to make uh, um, the carbohydrates to form their bodies. They give off oxygen. Uh, but we we're trained to think of roots as things that essentially suck up nutrients from the soil. And sure, they do, but it's not that simple. Plants are putting out exudates out into the soil, uh, things that we now know consist of carbohydrates, proteins, and there's even a paper that came out last year documenting that plants are pushing out lipids, fats, out of their roots and into the soil. What do those three things sound like? Sounds like lunch, breakfast, dinner. It's food. They're pushing it out into the soil to feed communities of microbes that live in the rhizosphere, the zone around the roots, and they're not doing it just to be nice. They're doing it because those microbes provide things that benefit the plants in return. And that's a lot of what, what Anne will talk about. I'm sure Elaine will talk about that more later. Um, I'll just leave it that, you know, to us, that was a real revelation that there's these symbioses and partnerships happening between plants and what we call the hidden half of nature, life below ground and life too small to see. And it turns out to be very important for not only maintaining, but building soil fertility. And the take-home lesson that we then went to try and apply uh, to farms around the world was the idea that this means that we can think about plants as having a diet. I had never really thought about plants having a diet before. I would thought more about eating plants. But if you think about sort of two ways that a plant can eat, if you feed a plant all the, mac the major elements that they need, the macronutrients that they need to grow big, that's sort of what we have learned to do in the 20th century in terms of our agricultural applications. Plants will put out less energy into growing the root systems. They'll put out less exudates into the soil. And what they get is fewer good microbial metabolites and fewer micronutrients in return. They essentially turn into what Ann and I termed couch potato crops. They get a little lazy. They don't do as much work. They don't need to. They're not as challenged. 
who among us isn't tempted to get a little lazy every now and then if things are really easy for us? Plants that are fed off of what you term the, the soil life diet or the soil health diet uh, put out where you have a lot of organic matter in the soil. They put out a much more robust root system. They put out more exudates. They get more micronutrients. They get more uh, beneficial microbial metabolites. Again, the stuff that Ann will talk more about uh, in the next talk. But they can grow big. The question is, which is a healthier plant? We all know that with fertilizers, you can grow big plants. You can maintain large yields. But here lies a pretty simple explanation, and I'll go in more into this, but a pretty simple explanation for the observation of why did we need, why did pesticide use become so much more in demand after we went to the wholesale use of fertilizers? There's a very strong connection. We basically disarmed our plant's defense system. And the hidden half of nature goes into that, uh, and Anne will talk about that. I want to talk for the rest of this talk about how you apply these ideas in agriculture. Because after we realized that we restored our yard in what to us was shockingly short order, you know, less than a decade, we were able to basically turn our dirt into relative, very fertile soil. If you think about that at a planetary scale, could we do this on big farms? Or do you have to have, you know, could you only do it on small farms where you're willing to invest a whole lot of your own labor and you have a coffee, bunch of coffee shops down the street where you can get free sources of nitrogen um, <laughs> at, with, from their coffee grounds? You know, how feasible was it to scale this up in real agricultural settings? So I took six months off uh, and went and visited farms around the world uh, who had restored life to their soil. Because, again, as a geologist, I wasn't prepared to tell farmers how to farm. So I did something that academics, I think, all too often don't do. And that is I went and asked people, how did you do it? What did you do? I went and what you might consider a listening tour if I was running for office. Um, <laughs> and that led to growing a revolution. And one of the things I basically found was that uh, if you visit uh, Rattan Lal at the Ohio State University, he's got a long-term experiment on, on uh, no-till agriculture, turning soil that looks like this into soil that looks like this. The difference between those two, applications of compost and manure. Maintained over 20 years. It radically transformed the soil. Um, he can give you more details on that, but let's just say that those, those color differences ought to look familiar. It's the opposite of what was done in North Carolina, but it's the same as what was done in our yard. And I'll show you more examples of that as we go. But what does this all tell us about the future? We simply can't continue to farm the way we have been, or we're going to farm ourselves right out of business. Um, we simply have to change agriculture in the 20th century. We're going to have more people to feed uh, over the course of this century, and the question is, how are we going to do it, uh, and how are we going to be able to not just get to this point, but maintain it? What could actually make for sustainable farming? We're not going to do it if we're running out of, of topsoil or its fertility. And I want to review just a, th three sort of key myths of modern agriculture um, that I go over in the book. And the first is that industrialized agrochemical agriculture feeds the world today. That's one of the first arguments you hear. We need that style of agriculture or we will all starve. Well, if you look at it, 72% of the world's farms are actually smaller than two and a half acres. Those are not really big farms. Large-scale, mechanized, industrialized, agrochemical agriculture feeds the developed world. It's not feeding the world. Industrialized agrochemical agriculture is more efficient. Well, actually, small diversified farms produce more food per acre. Depends how you define efficiency. If you define efficiency as how do you produce the most food with the land that we have available, which is the right way to define it in terms of feeding the world in the future, small-scale diversified farms are actually the way to produce more food. And industrialized agrochemical agriculture is necessary to feed the world of tomorrow. The rest of this talk is going to basically going to wrestle with that. Oops. But first of all, as sort of a down payment on that, I want to show this great figure from Jonathan Foley that just captures one of the big problems in terms of thinking about agriculture in the future of basically look at how much of the world's agricultural land uh, in different areas is devoted to feeding people versus feeding livestock and providing fuel. There's an awful, and look at the difference. Uh, in the tropical regions in the developing world, it's mostly, uh, our agricultural land is mostly feeding people. In the Western world, it's mostly not feeding people. The idea that the that our agricultural production in the American Midwest, or even in, in the United States as a whole, is necessary to feed the world is demonstrably false. Because that's not what the food is actually going to. Most of it is going to feed cars and livestock. And there's a bonus myth that I'll throw in, too, um, that is basically that GMOs increase crop yields. There's this great 
graphic from the New York Times that basically demonstrates fairly well that at least as far as corn goes, the simple answer is they didn't. You look at you look at corn yields um, in Europe and the U.S. and what is it? Uh, Western Europe, I think, is yellow. The U.S. is is blue. 85 to 2014, it spans the time when GMO varieties are introduced in the U.S. Those lines are perfectly parallel to one another. Even the NRC concluded there was no evidence that GMO crops have actually increased crop yield. So when you hear the argument that we need GMOs to feed the world, it's like, well, no. There's other ways to farm that can actually produce this comparable yields. And that's basically the increases in yields we've seen over the past few decades have greatly been due to the traditional crop breeding that has been at work in both GMO and non-GMO varieties. That's where the increases in yield have come from. If we look at how to maintain our agricultural production uh, well into the future, we first run into the problem that we're using, what, something like 10 calories of fossil fuels to produce one calorie of edible food these days. And if you think about our uh, reliance on fuels, we're not going to be able to do that for much, for much longer from a geological perspective for the simple reason, not that we're going to run out of oil, because we're never going to run out of oil. As something becomes more scarce, it will become more expensive, and therefore there will be more exploration to try and find more. But the key thing there is it'll become more expensive. So as we get past the peak in oil production, whenever that is, whether it was back in 2010 or whether it's going to be in 2030 now, um, whenever that is, once we're on the far side of it, the price of that commodity is going to start going up. And if it does, that's going to have implications for any production process that is fundamentally dependent on it. And so the question of, of can we actually maintain the, 21, the 20th century strategy of intensified fertilizer use into the future to feed the world is a very valid question. Why? Because fertilizer production, the way we do it now, is very energy intensive. Are we going to really be able to rely on fossil fuel derived nitrogen fertilizer in 2100 to feed a 10 billion person world and do it cost effectively? I suggest that it's not necessarily a good bet. This then brings up the question, of course, of you know, building soil fertility would actually be really helpful for feeding a post-cheap oil and fertilizer world. Um, this is not the direction we tend to be looking at policy-wise at present, but you know, if you look at a few decades or up to a century, I don't see any way around wrestling with this problem of what's going to replace the style of production that we have today when we move into this new, uh, essentially, era. And... That, these are the kind of questions that I was sort of um, wrestling with when I went out to visit farms around the world, uh, where I visited farmers who had adopted different styles of agriculture and had already rebuilt the fertility of their land and greatly reduced their use of agrochemicals. Uh, and basically, I saw how adopting the principles of conservation agriculture could match conventional yields using far less oil and chemical inputs. Really, a model for how we might be able to farm in a post-cheap oil and fertilizer world. And I... What are those principles? Well, they really boil down to three simple things. Don't disturb the soil, keep the land covered with cover crops, and adopt a diversified crop portfolio. Now, why do those things work together to restore fertility to the land? That's a recipe to essentially build microbial life, to cultivate the beneficial life in the soil, to cultivate the hidden half of nature. And these are the three basic common principles of the farmers that I visited. And I'll show you some of their examples because the practices they used in different parts of the world, whether it was Central America, whether Africa, uh, North America, were completely different. You wouldn't use the same practices in Ghana that you use in the Dakotas. Different climate, different soils, different crops, different technological levels. But these principles were robust. The trick is how, figuring out how to adapt these to different crops and different environments in ways that can actually cultivate beneficial life in the soil and use that to rebuild soil fertility and soil organic matter. First of these principles, well, how, how do you adopt no-till agriculture? There's a lot of different ways to do it, uh, but uh, this is an Ohio farmer, David Brandt, who's modeling his no-till planter here. Uh, it's basically something that uh, carves a, a trench in the soil. You drop a seed down into that little trench, and then uh, you, the Closing wheels close that trench back up, and and you're left with, in the aftermath of a planting, this is a freshly planted field, you can barely tell that the land has been disturbed. Compare in your mind's eye this to what we saw in the Palouse, with that soil bleeding off the landscape. It's like night and day. This is a very effective way to shut down soil erosion. Now, will it work for everyone to have a no-till planter like this? No, of course not. 
This is just an example of one way to think differently about how to plant. Um, in terms of how to manage cover crops, uh, you know, one of the great advantages of the plow is that it's really good weed control, right? And so one of the questions of, well, how do you actually control weeds without the plow? Cover crops are a good way to think about doing that. But to keep the cover crops from turning into weeds, you've got to basically kill them before they go to seed. And this shows you Jeff Moyer from the Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania modeling his um, – is roller crimper that you can put on the front of one of those no-till planters. And then in the single pass of the plow, uh, that single pass of a tractor, excuse me, you could um, basically mow down a cover crop and plant the next crop right through it without tilling the soil. You've kept the soil completely covered. There's no bare earth. Um, and you don't have any weed problems because you planted the weeds. You planted cover crops and you managed them. Uh, it's a different way to think about the soil and different way to think about farming. Uh, and again, not everyone's going to have one of these. Uh, the different the kinds of cover crops that you would have or use in different regions are obviously going to be different depending on your climate zone and your soil type. But with that kind of thinking in mind about how would you go about implementing these different kinds of practices on different kinds of land around the world, uh, you can start thinking about the generalized principles and whether they hold. This is Dwayne Beck from the D Dakota Lakes Research Farm. He is uh, uh, that's run in conjunction with South Dakota State University. It's right in the heart of the area that was then that photograph from the Dust Bowl that I showed you with the FDR quote that's on the cover of the Dirt Book. He took me on a 300 mile tour of the. Basically, what he's using is he's using livestock as an accelerator to break down and process the organic matter that his cover crops and his crop residue um, are producing. And he's using them to accelerate the recycling of that material and thinking about ecological processes and cycling. And what has this done to his soil? Well, one of these, these are Gabe's hands, and one of them holds the soil from his neighbor's organic farm that has tillage. It's a plow-based organic farm. It's a long-term organic farm, but it uses the plow. And the other soil is Gabe's soil from his not really organic farm, but very, very organic-ish farm. Um, and you've probably already guessed because of the way I'm doing this, that this is the soil from Gabe's farm and that's the neighboring farm's organic soil. Reminds you of the color differences in our yard and in North Carolina and at Rattan Lowell's thing. Um, you know, this is what you want. Um, and the point that I want to make there is that you don't necessarily have to be completely organic to get to rebuild the health and fertility of your land, but it sure helps to be organic-ish. What are basically the uh, the common elements then in terms of recommendations for farmers? I tried to boil it down uh, with with Anne's help in coming up with you know ditch the plow, cover up, and grow diversity was the advice that I gave in Growing Revolution. These three principles of conservation agriculture, figuring out how to apply them to different kinds of farms in different kinds of settings, is a recipe for rebuilding the health and fertility of land. And it's a fairly simple recipe that doesn't have a prescription of exactly what kind of practices need to be done. I think that two of the biggest mistakes of the 20th century agriculturally were basically assuming that we could use the same practices everywhere all at once and make the land adapt to our practices. That didn't work out so well. Um, and the second big mistake we made was undervaluing the ingenuity of the world's farmers and their ability to take this kind of broad advice and figure out how to make it work on their farm. Each of the farmers that I visited who'd figured out these systems of farming that adopt embrace these principles admitted that along the way they made plenty of mistakes. They kept experimenting and they kept trying, but they also insisted that they could they could teach their neighbors in their region how to do the transition much faster because they'd already made all those mistakes. And any good researcher knows that half the time, I mean, learning from your own mistakes is the way to actually make progress. And sharing those lessons is the way to move us all forward. Um, so basically, what are the benefits of conservation agriculture and adopting these practices from the survey of farmers around the world? And I also visited farmers in Central America and Canada and other parts of the U.S. But basically, comparable or increased yields. Once you restore fertility to your land, you can basically match conventional yields with unconventional methods. And that's the big thing that's been missing from an awful lot of comparisons of agronomic methods and simply by focusing on crop yield. And this can be done with greatly reduced fossil fuel and pesticide use, um, whether or not one is organic. I actually visited an organic farm as well to see if these principles would work there, and they do. Um, increased soil carbon and water retention, that uh, relates to both the climate issue uh, and crop resilience. If you're able to maintain and store more water in the soil, um, particularly in um, moisture-challenged 
challenged regions that can be very important. But most importantly, I think, which maybe I should put this one first, this led to better farm economics, higher farmer profits. This is why I actually turned from a deep pessimist in writing the dirt book into a bit of an optimist in thinking about these kind of practices could be adopted and shared widely because if they, if the practices there can actually rebuild soil fertility, start to line up with the short-term economic interests of farmers, that's a recipe for getting society's long-term interest in the health and fertility of the land actually satisfied over time. And that was a big problem that I developed at length and looked at in writing the dirt book was how those incentives were often working at odds to one another throughout history. Particularly when you think of patterns of land ownership and tenure and slavery and things like that that I go into in the dirt book. But if, if it makes economic sense for farmers to restore the fertility of their land, over time, more of them will start doing it. And this is where being a geologist becomes a bit of an advantage because if I can think that, wow, if we could make this transition in the next 30 years, that's really fast. What can we do in terms of carbon sequestration? Well, to be frank, if you look at the estimates for how much carbon we could park in the world's agricultural soils, the estimates are all over the map. At the low end, you can, uh, Rattan Lau's conservatively estimated we can offset 5 to 15% of global fossil fuel emissions for, you know, five decades or so. Uh, at the high end, some have suggested that carbon sequestration cells could fully offset fossil fuel emissions. I'm not quite that optimistic. I don't think the numbers pencil out to be quite that way. But the key thing is, is that the numbers are huge. Even if you take the low end, the numbers are huge and significant. And we should be basically restoring fertility to our land. The, the practices that we would do to restore fertility are the same as the practices we would do to sequester carbon. We should basically do everything we can to encourage farmers to do more of it, take the, car, take the climate benefit, but also the long-term fertility benefit. Uh, so this is not really a question of low-tech organic versus GMO and agrotech. I wanna emphasize that. It's a question of how to apply an understanding of soil ecology to the applied problem of increasing and sustaining crop yields in a post-oil environment. It's a bit of a mouthful, but basically what's that saying? That's saying is that, you know, maybe we should put a lot more attention into trying to convert the world's conventional farmers to organic-ish, because if we did, it would literally change the world and change farming practices. And if we can get the, the difference between organic farming and conventional farming much narrower, everybody wins. Uh, and so basically I'm in the position uh, now, uh, three books into this, of arguing that we're poised, hopefully, for what I consider to be the fifth agricultural revolution. Now, academics like to argue about how many there have been so far, and I'm not an agronomist, I'm a geologist, so I'm not really going to be that concerned about whether it's four or five or six or, you know, whether my typology is correct. Uh, this is just the way I see it. The first agricultural revolution was cultivation and tillage in the first place, the idea that we could grow crops. The idea of agriculture was revolutionary. Um, the second agricultural revolution I like to think of as the, the realization of soil husbandry and crop rotations, the idea of planting legumes along with crops to, to increase the fertility of the land, and that there were practices in agriculture that could help build and sustain the fertility of the land. Uh, da Vinci's quote, uh, which was mentioned yesterday, um, we know more about the moving celestial bodies than about the soil underfoot is one of the few quotes in science from 500 years ago that's still current. Think about that. It's pretty astounding. Uh, the, the third agricultural revolution, mechanization and industrialization that swept through the developed world in the 19th and 20th centuries, you know, radically transformed agriculture. Fully a third of the carbon that was added to the atmosphere between 1850 and 1978 was added from plowing up the plains and, and, of the Midwest and in Europe. Uh, we got to go into all that in, in the dirt book, but basically, um, you know, the idea of fertilization and mechanization obviously radically transformed agriculture. I call that the third, rev the third revolution. The part that we don't hear about in terms of Justice von Liebig, though, is something that I learned in writing the, the Growing a Revolution. And that is, Liebig wrote two important books on agriculture. His first book was written in 1840. And that's the one that gave rise to the modern fertilizer industry. That's the one everybody reads, everybody, or uh, nobody reads old books anymore, right? That's the one everybody cites. Um, but if you actually go back and read the book he re wrote at the end of his life, in 1863, called The Natural Laws of Husbandry, the father of fertilizers, Liebig, recommended returning organic matter to the fields to provide crops with a full complement of nutrients. He explicitly argued that if you only gave crops one or two key elements, think NPK, 
If you only gave them the, the few elements, they would run out of the micronutrients they need to actually grow and be healthy themselves, and that might actually cascade into what happens to us. He argued very explicitly for closing the loop in terms of organic matter, returning organic matter back to the fields as essential for sustaining agriculture. Think about that. The father of fertilizers at the end of his life, at the full peak of his experience, basically suggested that maybe that wasn't the right way to go after all. It was an incomplete way to look at things. I recommend his book. I, I synopsize it in Growing a Revolution. I'd never heard of that book. I hadn't read it until I started researching that book, realized I needed to read it. And as I read it, I was like, wow, this is different. We haven't learned the full history. The fourth agricultural revolution was the Green Revolution of Biotechnology. I mean, there's no doubt that crop yields went up in the 20th century as a result of using more fertilizer-friendly crop varieties. Uh, as I talked about earlier, there's no evidence that GMOs have actually increased crop yields. But these were, uh, together, I consider sort of a major technological revolution in the way we practice agriculture. And that brings us to what I hope will be the fifth revolution, as I called the last chapter of growing a revolution. Um, and that is basically thinking about prioritizing soil health and rebuilding soil health. Because uh, if we really put the way that we think about soils through this kind of intellectual transformation, it would radically transform the way we think about and practice agriculture if we prioritize those practices that rebuild the health and fertility of the land. Um, and I think it's essential for doing that in a post-cheap oil and fertilizer world. But it's um, also something that, based on these visits to farmers around the world who've already done this, that I'm convinced this is not a theory. This is not an abstract idea. This is something people have already done and demonstrated to work. The question is whether we can adopt it widely, whether it'll catch on whether it will spread and truly become the next agricultural revolution. And when you think about the, the basic principles that have underpinned agriculture for the last 100 years, it's been intensive tillage, intensive uh, fertilizer and agrochemical use, and growing one or two crops, functional monocultures. Those three principles of going to no-till or ditching the plow, marrying it with cover crops, and growing a diversity of crops, takes those three basic ideas and flips them all 180 degrees on their head. That's what we're really talking about and why I think it actually is a revolution in thought. And so as I put it in the book, it's a revolution in how we think about soil that has to basically precede how we act towards it. And people have already started this. It's already been adopted. Um, we need to use the insights of soil ecology to restructure agricultural technology to build soil health and enhance biological nutrient cycling. That's the, the fancy way to put it. The short way to put it is I think we need to merge the best of the ancient wisdom of cover crops and crop rotations, because these are not new ideas after all, right? These are ideas that go way back in many societies. We need to take the best of that ancient wisdom and merge it with the best of modern technology to figure out how to do this low disturbance style of agriculture that cultivates beneficial soil life. Um, there's ways to think about how to promote it in terms of uh, reforming crop insurance and subsidy programs. Uh, you know, we're basically subsidizing practices that degrade the land. That's kind of crazy. Uh, we should establish demonstration farms in each of the places that I visited where these ideas had caught on. It was due to the efforts of a demonstration farm where farmers could go to a place and look at a full-scale farm, not research plots, a full-scale farm where people had actually used these practices, showed that they worked. Why is that important? Because who wants to run the risk of an experiment of doing something new on your own farm when what you're risking is your livelihood. And lot, farmers, I think, are a lot more likely to adopt these practices if they see a full-scale example and go, oh, you're a farmer, you've done it. I'm, a, I'm as good a farmer as you. I can do this too. Uh, and providing transition assistance. There can be a several-year transition in terms of uh, lower yields um, as one is transitioning and trying, starting to rebuild organic matter, I think if we think in terms of what we should be subsidizing agriculturally, we should be subsidizing people making the transition, not people maintaining the force. Um, but I'm not a, what do I know? I'm not a policy person. Um, so basically, why would we want to uh, invest the time and effort into restoring fertility of the world's agricultural lands? I mean, you all probably know all this, but basically it'll help us feed the world. It can help us sequester carbon to uh, uh, help with climate change, even if it won't actually solve the problem. There'll be a huge down payment on doing that. It can help us reverse environmental degradation. If you think about the future of biodiversity on the planet, our agricultural lands occupy a third of our, of our continental land masses, a quarter to a third. The future of biodiversity in this world is tied to what we do on farms. And just as importantly, I think, if not the most important, is that we could start to restore profitability to small farms, make small-scale farms much uh, a viable living once again. 
But this is something I think would be hugely important uh, for, for rural communities across, not just across North America, but around the world. And this different philosophy and style of farming, I think, could very much help with that. Uh, so with that, I will uh, sort of end what I'm uh, talking about. I have no idea where we are with time, but I think we probably have time for some 15 minutes. We've got time for a few questions. And I did bring copies, uh, Ann and I brought copies of all three books, if anyone want to, wants to pick them up to see us outside when we're done. Uh, and again, Ann will talk much more about the hidden half of nature in her talk that is next. So January 13th, Gabe Brown is speaking at NOFA Mass in Worcester. All right, I highly recommend seeing him. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the declining uh, nutrient content, uh, content of crops is something that we uh, synthesized and summarized in uh, The Hidden Half of Nature. Uh, and we think it has a lot to do with interaction with soil micro microbiota. Um, but the uh, Anna and I are starting to work now on a book trying to connect soil health to human health. And one of the key arguments in there is that we not only need to grow large yields of crops, we need to grow large yields of nutrient-dense crops of, of, of much healthier much healthier crops. And yeah, if we could get by with fewer calories that were better provisioned, shall we say, um, it could help us with that land problem. Um, the, one of the key things in terms of the growth and yields that we see in the 20th century is that fertilizers worked really well to boost yields on degraded land. They didn't work so well on land that was already fertile. And so an alternative is to restore fertility. Yes. 
Yeah, no, I'm familiar with that. And there's a chapter in Growing Revolution that talks about tropical soils, talks about Bokashi, talks about EM, talks about um, things like that. Uh, the problem of laterites are uh, basically that they're, they tend to be on flat terrain and they tend to be places where you've uh, had long-term leaching of most of, of lots of the mineral content of the soil. So it's very enriched in a few, the, the things that stay behind, um, iron and aluminum in particular. Um, and so, yeah, if you have, uh, if you have a geology where you don't have the micronutrients that plants need to grow wherever it is in the world, uh, that can be a problem. You can think of what the biological world is doing in terms of trans transitioning the geology of the planet into biology is it's refining things. So you look at the bulk chemistry of life and the bulk chemistry of the planet and they're different. So you can think of life as essentially refining and taking a lot of the micronutrients that we need and getting it into biological circulation. So if you clear the forest like they've done through most of Brazil, you've lost the reservoir of most of that stuff that was there. And you'll need to bring the soil life back to sort of get it back into circulation. But if you're depending on what geology you're in there, you may need to add other things as well. So why don't we cut it there? And if people are interested in asking more questions, you can catch me outside. If you're interested in the book, uh, feel free to catch me outside too. And we'll transition to, to Anne will be speaking in a few minutes.